Uh, Brad, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Hey, Jimmy, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, man, you've done a, you've done a lot of real estate in your life. I, I, I very rarely will find somebody that's done more real estate transaction wise than I have, but I think, I think you've got me by quite a, quite a ways. Well, I, I don't know about that. I think you've done a lot too. <laughs> yeah. So you, let me just, for my audience, I, cause I, I, I love to talk to people like yourself that have really put yourself in the game and done a lot of different transactions. Cause you see a lot more and you're able to speak to it a lot more honestly, I think. Um, but you own currently around 7,700 units yourself. Is that correct? And you've helped your students. I mean, your students have bought over a hundred thousand different doors in their lives and, you know, over $6 billion worth of real estate. But, um, is that where you're currently at about 7,700 properties? Yeah. Plus or minus. That sounds about right. Okay. Well, I want to get, I love getting into people's real estate journey. Like how did you get into real estate? I know I got in as a real estate agent first and then you're just finding deals and you know, they fall in your life. Next thing you know, you're a real estate investor, but somebody like yourself, I'd love to hear how the journey starts for somebody to get to 7,700 doors. Well, look, man, I've been doing this 22 years. So, you know, people talk about an overnight success and then they don't see all the work and the time and the energy. But let me just tell you, I never thought I'd be doing real estate. Um, my parents, uh, never owned real estate as an investor. They never even finished college. And my dad finished three years of school and his boss was an engineer. So when I was growing up, I would hear all these stories about like, man, you got to be an engineer. Like your father's boss, they're going to Hawaii and we're going to Lake Erie. You know, I grew up in Pittsburgh. So it was like, study hard, get good grades. You know, the whole Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad story was basically me. And so I did all that stuff and I did everything right. So I thought and have two degrees, engineer MBA and work for corporate America 14 years. And I found myself in my early thirties of being like, I was, I actually lost my job twice, not once, but two times. And actually thought about going to law school. And I'll never forget, I was studying for the LSAT exam somewhere back in like in the year 2000, 2001. And back in those days, I'm in Houston, Texas, and on summer, hot summer days, I would go to Barnes and Noble and Borders. These were like before Amazon was there, like we would go to bookstores and like hang out when it was hot. So I would go and look at the bestsellers and I saw that purple and gold book wrote, written by Robert Kiyosaki and I picked it up, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then I read his second book, The Cash Flow Quadrant. And that Cash Flow Quadrant talked about ESBI, employee, self employed, business owner and investor. And I was on the employee side. And one day I hoped to be self-employed. And then I was like, man, I really need to be on the other side. And nobody ever taught me this. <clears throat> and then Kiyosaki had all these nuggets of information in there. And, you know, he talked about real estate network marketing as being like two businesses that you could get into with low barriers to entry. And in real estate, you know, I, I was more um, gravitated toward real estate more than network marketing. And so I sought out real estate seminars and I was living in Houston, Texas. And I went, I, I never forget the first time I went to a real estate investing seminar, man, I was like skeptical and thinking like, what am I going to learn? And I walked in there with my arms crossed and sat in the back of the room. <clears throat> and by the second day, I'm excited and I'm in the front row and I'm taking all these notes. And so that's how I got started is I, I went to real estate investing seminars. I actually bought like a mentorship program. And you know what, Jimmy, I followed it and it worked. <clears throat> and that's how I got it. That's how I got in the business. And that was in 2001. Wow. And so, I mean, we've had so many different markets since 2001, right? I got into my journey in about 2005 and 2007, eight, nine almost wiped me out. Thank God I survived it. But um, what was your experience when the market collapsed? Where were you at with real estate? How many properties did you own? And how did you get through the collapse in 06, 07, 08? Yeah. I mean, look, man, it was tough, you know, and I had probably eight or 900 units at that point. And I remember like, I, I, and in fact, I just bought a deal in April of 08 and I was so excited about it. And it was a syndication. It was over 200 units. And I had a little bit of my money and a lot of other people's money in the deal. And, you know, the bottom dropped out like a few months after I bought that deal. And not only that, the deal was in Houston and we got hit with Hurricane Ike. And so we had all these units that got damaged by the hurricane from wind and, you know, roofs being ripped off. And and so we had the greatest financial crisis in my lifetime and we had a hurricane 
And I remember that deal, like I personally put like 800,000 more into that deal just to keep it going, just to pay the bills. Um, and it took me 14 months to get insurance money. And, and plus, you know, just a lot of austerity and, and tightening, tightening operations and, and, and funding the deal personally to get through that downturn. But we got through it. And, you know, the, the happy ending was, you know, we sold the deal like 2013, 2014. I don't remember the exact time, but we got all of our money out. I got all the money I put into it and we made a profit. So, you know, sometimes you just got to be resilient. Um, you got to wait, like everything that goes up eventually will have a, you know, some sort of downturn and we're in another one now, but what comes after that is another upturn in the market. Well, you've sold, I mean, you've had so many different clients and customers come through and they use your method. I would love to hear a little bit about what is your method? What is your philosophy for how you invest? You know, and I always tell people there's no wrong way to invest in real estate. There's a million different ways to make money doing it. You want to become really good at one that works and then just do it over and over again. But what is your own personal philosophy of how you invest in in real estate? Yeah. So one thing just to be clear on is like I specialize in one asset class and that's multifamily buildings. Correct. And I started, I bought my own deals with my own money. And so my first property I ever did as an investment was not a single family rental or a duplex or a fourplex. It was a 32 unit building. And my first real estate mentor, he said, Brad, buy as many doors or units as you can in, in one transaction. And you'll have the maximum like efficiencies and the maximum economies of scale. But, you know, he didn't teach to like syndicate a deal using other people's money. So my first deal was 32 units. My second deal was 30 units. And then I ran out of money. But the idea was to get scale as much as you can. And I still believe in that today. And and instead of just using your own money where you're limited with income and net worth and liquidity and, you know, you're if no matter no, no matter how many units you can buy, on your own, you're limited in some capacity. Like even even a guy like Grant Cardone is going to be limited in some capacity. That's why he has Cardone Capital, right? So you can only do so much with your own money, your own time, your own uh, experience. And so, but what I did back then, and I still do today. So one of my philosophies is 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 buy more units so you have scale. So when I started, it was 32 and 62, but then my third transaction was 250 units. And what I learned was it was easier to buy like a bigger deal and hire professional management and get better financing and have better efficiencies and, you know, more professional staff than it was to have a 32 unit building with your own money. Mm -hmm. So philosophy number one is what I teach my students to this day is even with no experience, you could go in and syndicate 60, 80, 100 units because now you're buying a business and it's just it just happens to be an apartment business. But we are teaching people, and I do it myself, to come in and be a business owner and not necessarily you know, a self-employed, do-it-yourself type of person. So if you're going to your properties and knocking on doors and collecting the rents and going to the eviction court, like I've never personally evicted anybody Jimmy, even with my 32 unit, I had a part-time manager and a part-time maintenance person. So even though like as a business owner, we've evicted people for legal reasons like non-payment or rent, I've never actually done it myself. So that's a big philosophy that I have is buy enough doors to hire professional management. Another is market selection. Like Look, obviously people own apartment buildings in New York and LA and San Francisco, but I like to buy in landlord and business friendly environments. So like the vast majority of my portfolio, and I'm currently in over 7,000 doors now and was up to 10,000 at one point is in Texas. Number two is in Florida, you know, and I also have properties in other landlord and business friendly environments. I own properties in Ohio, Oklahoma, Colorado, um, Georgia, Arizona, but the, again, the majority are in Florida and Texas. And then I look for, you know, value added opportunities. So what does that mean? Like, where's the property underperforming? Maybe it's under managed. Maybe it's under renovated. 
you know, maybe there's other sources of income that we can implement, like parking or laundry or cable or Wi-Fi. So I look for deals that have meat on the bone so that we could go in and increase the value because in multifamily, just like any other commercial uh, real estate or many businesses that are even non-real estate, you know, multifamily buildings are valued by, you know, income generated. So the more income we could generate, just like any business, like, you you know, this, you go in and you take over a business. And if you could raise the EBITDA, you're going to raise the value of the business. So to me, multifamily is just the business that I specialize in, but it's not that different than like taking over a business and making it more valuable. Mm-hmm. So question, I mean, you said you bought your first unit was 32, uh, 32 units at a time, 32 doors. Is it even possible to do deals like that today? Like when you're teaching new students now, like where do you look for opportunities and how do you even start to approach a purchase like that? Well, a couple of things. So number one is first thing I do is I, you know, like if I were to assess somebody, I would say, hey, let's see where you're at right now. Like where, where do you bring to the table in terms of your skill set? You know, do you know how to underwrite deals? Um, are you a social networker where you may have a big network of people? Do you think you could raise some money over, you know, a short period of time or if you committed to this business? So we're going to do like a skill set assessment. We're going to do like an, and that worth assessment. Like what financial resources do you bring to the table? So like when I bought that 32 unit deal and this was 22 years ago, you know, it was about a million dollars. And so you need 20 to 40% down. And then you need a net worth that's equal to or more than the loan amount. So like to to buy 32 units for a million dollars, I had the liquidity because I was working in corporate America for 14 years and I was saving my money. And my net worth at that time, 22 years ago, was around 700K. So I was able to meet the lender requirements for income, you know, for net worth, for liquidity, and buy that deal. So same thing today. Now today, a million dollars is probably not going to get you 32 doors, you know, even in the markets that I like, and I'm not buying in like New York or LA or San Francisco, but in like Dallas, or just say, for example, Salt Lake City, like I have some students that own there, like for, for um, a well-located 1970s asset, which I would call a C-class property, you know, in a safe, a relatively safe, low crime area, say in a working class neighborhood, but a 1970s building, it's probably going to be more than a hundred thousand a unit. Mm-hmm. So to buy 32 units right now might be three to four million dollars. And so again, like you're going to need 750k to buy that deal. And, and so I would advise somebody not to do that. I would say, look, but 750k. You could put 150,000 into five syndications and, and leverage other people's money and, and, and be a general partner in these deals, right? Where you get carried interest like a piece of the pie. And so if I were coaching somebody that had 750K liquid, I would say, hey, invest in yourself, learn the ropes of the business, build your team, get your lender, get your management company, get your insurance provider. You know, join an investor community, whether it's mine or somebody else's, but you got to be around people that they want to invest and that are qualified to invest. <clears throat> and so that's what I would advise somebody to do. You know, now if they said, hey, no way that that doesn't align with me or that's not what I want to do, then I'd say, yeah, sure. I could help you go out and buy 10, 12, 15 units, but you got to understand it's going to be a lot more hands on. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's not easy to find a great property manager or property management company to run a 10 plex. What do you think about the current environment that we're in? I mean, uh, it's gotten really hard. I know for me, we, you know, we sold a lot of homes to investors from, you know, 2011 all the way to about 2021. And then really the numbers in Utah at least didn't make sense. So we found other markets. Um, for me, the one thing that I, you know, obsess over is cash flow. I don't know if in commercial in these larger properties, it's a little bit different what you're looking for. But where are the opportunities today? What's the current state of the market that we're in, Brad? Well, I think the state of the market is similar to like the best analogy I can make is if you could remember how things were like in 2010. Okay. So when I look at 2010, 
it was tough to do deals in 2010 because uh, I can't remember what the interest rates were in 2010, but they were probably around five or six percent, yep. which is which they are now. Okay, so like the interest rates now are not really that high historically; they're just high compared to where they were like two years ago. Yeah, you know, in 2002, the first deal I ever bought that 32 unit, my interest rate was 6.4 percent. So it's not really that high historically, but you know. Um, you know, debt is a little tighter to get right now. So like you might be able to get like a 60 to 70% loan on an acquisition as opposed to 80%. So you're going to need more equity. And then if you go to raise money, you know, again, like investors in the community as a whole, like the population as a whole, we tend to have short-term memory. So people will be like, oh, multifamily, there's a lot of negative stuff in the news right now. You know, you're seeing... Uh, distressed deals and p- loans that are going to be potentially distressed. But it was like that in 2008, 9, and 10, and 11. And and I wish that I would have bought more real estate back then, Jimmy, honestly, but I didn't. Because, you know, and it, it just like back then now, like sellers that don't need to sell, like if, if, if you got a 10-year loan and you're in year three or four, why would you sell now? Because prices are down 20 to 30% from the peak. Mm-hmm. So the only people that want to sell right now are people that need to sell. So number one, we could find really good deals that are a little distressed from people that need to sell. So there's a lot of opportunity, okay? But it's probably harder to get the debt and maybe psychologically a little harder to raise money. But you know, and, and so if it's harder to raise the, if it's harder to get the debt and debt's more expensive, it's going to impact your cash flow. But if you're buying at a lower price point, it's going to increase your cash flow. And similarly, if you buy at a lower price point, I mean, I think you would concur with this. If, if we could look back in hindsight and you're buying in the trough of a market cycle, there's a lot more upside potential. So like when I buy apartments, I look for three things. I look for cash flow. I look for upside potential and I look for tax savings. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things. And I've invested at different phases of my life based on my own financial needs. I have invested. There was a time where my earned income was so high that my primary driver was, I need to invest this year to have depreciation loss to offset my taxes. That was, I went through a a period of time like that. Now I didn't, I'm not saying I would buy a bad deal just to get depreciation, but there were a few deals I did where I was like, Hey, instead of putting a hundred thousand into this deal, I'm going to put 3 million. Like Jimmy, I literally put millions of dollars into a transaction so I could get, you know, and you're probably familiar with the bonus depreciation that they call the cost segregation. Yeah. So like in 2020, 2020, 21, 22, I was putting, millions of dollars of my own money into deals and I was paying no federal tax. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's been deals that I invested in primarily for cash flow. Like, like right now when I'm investing in deals, I am looking for yield. So like how I'm finding yield is I'm buying deals at a distressed price point and I'm assuming loans at 4%. Like there are deals where you could assume a fixed rate loan at 4% and you know, I've, I got into some recent deals where we're cash flowing like seven, eight, nine percent out of the gate, you know, with upside. Mm. And, and if you compare that and say, hey, well, the risk free rate is five percent in a bank account. And that's only, you know, if you could get five percent in the bank account and you get eight percent with multifamily, why would you take on the extra risk for that extra three percent? But, you, you know, people that understand compounding, it's not three percent. Eight percent is 60 percent higher than five percent. And explain that for the people that don't understand it. Yeah, well, 5%, if if you take, if you say, uh, you know, 8% is only 3% higher than 5%, it's not. Like 3% higher than 5%, if you take out a calculator, you know, you you take 5% times 1.03, and it would be 5.15%. So that's 3% higher. You know, 8%, is 60% higher. If you take 8% divided by 5%, it's 1.6 bigger. So when you look at compounding and you compound at 8% 
Like if you take the rule of 72, how, how fast does money double, right? If you're making an 8% return, and let me, I got my calculator here. You take 72 divided by eight, your money doubles every nine years. If you have 72 divided by five, your money doubles every, uh, why can't I do the math now? I'm having performance anxiety. <laughs> You, you, your money doubles every 15 years or 14 years. So, so that's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Plus, plus, you're not just getting the 8% cash return. You're getting upside. Like we're buying low because we're at the bottom of a cycle. At least I believe we're at the bottom of a cycle. So there's going to be more upside when you sell and you're going to get an immediate tax saving. So your return is not just the difference between 5 and 8%. It's, that's, the, that's the cash return. And then there's the upside where you have no upside if you have your money in a bank account, your upside is 5%, and then you have no tax advantage. So you're making 5%, but you're paying 40% you know, tax bracket, so you're really only making 3% on your money. Yeah. What are you, Do you have any fear about essentially the just the affordability of what's going on and for renters? Well, yeah, well, yes. And this is also why, like, you know, I'm an engineer in, in, in training. So I look for markets that, I mean, look, people need a place to live. And I know that's cliche, but I want to explain that. And I, I do want to explain it because I hear people that have no idea what they're talking about. And they're just saying, oh, everyone needs a place to live. And I'm like, that's not enough of a justification. But so if you look at like affordability gap, which is the monthly payment difference between like, let's take a working class family that makes 60000 a year, family of four, and they're living in Salt Lake City. A mm-hmm. median priced home in Salt Lake City for like a three bedroom, two bath, 1600 square foot home, what would that cost? Five half, mi- half a million, yeah. Yeah, it's 500. It's probably 450 in Dallas. It's 450 to 500 in Tampa. So these are like three markets that I would, that I've just dialed into, right? So, so that PITI, principal interest tax and insurance is going to be like over 3000 a month for that family. A, a median priced apartment unit is going to be 1800 a month, 1700 a month, you know, 1600 a month. So, so for them to rent, they're going to save 1500, 1600, 1400 a month. That's a big gap. And then there, there are markets, Jimmy, where wage growth, and I have a chart. I'm not looking at it right now, but I was just looking at it the other night when I was doing a Zoom meeting for my students that I mentor. And, you know, there are markets where wage growth has exceeded uh, rent growth. And so we find those markets where, where we, I look for markets where the cost of buying a medium priced home is vastly more expensive than renting a medium priced apartment. I look at markets that have high job growth and high population growth and markets where there's relatively strong wage growth. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not really in the business of buying like the new class A uh, buildings that are like high rises. Like I was just in Austin, Texas last week and you take a picture of the skyline and there's cranes all over the place. And, 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 you know, they're suffering there because of that. There's a lot of new inventory coming on. And so you have higher vacancies and higher concessions a- across the board. So I like to buy in like your uh, middle class and working class neighborhoods where the buildings are like two, they go this way, you know, two or three stories instead of this way. And, and they're in these uh, neighborhoods where, you know, families are making between 50 to 70,000 a year. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's your best advice? I think for, you know, new real estate investors, I think they're a little bit frustrated. It, you know, it was easy when I, even when I got into real estate, you could get a house if you were owner occupying it for six months, put $5,000 down. And then, you know, you move every six months and do it again, buying duplexes and things like that. Nowadays, do you recommend people start with the single family homes and kind of, you know, the monopoly theory of four houses in a, in a hotel or to go straight for it to do the multifamily like you did? Well, look, I, I, it would be hard for me to say start with single family and then move up because that's not how I started. So like, you know, I, I believe that just like my first mentor told me, and I'm just telling you what he told me, and this was 20 years ago. So the numbers have changed a little bit, but he said, look, day one, he taught single family rentals. Day two, 
He said, if you got 100000 or more in the bank account, you can skip single family and invest right into multifamily. And, you know, you could be a passive investor with that money or you could go buy as many doors as you can with that money. And so I, I, I adhere to the same belief. And maybe it's more than 100K. You know, maybe I would say, hey, look, if you got 200K liquid, like why, why start, you know, Stephen Covey would used to teach, begin with the end in mind. So like if, if somebody, now, now that, look, a lot of my clients already are doing single family. They have six, eight, 10, 12, 14 homes or duplexes. And, and so those people too, those people were perfect to like move to the next level and move into multifamily or their first syndication. But if you're new, I would just say this, look, if you, it depends, like, look, if you, if you have a good income and you have a couple hundred K saved and you're committed, you could skip doing the single family stuff because the skill set that you're going to learn doing single family and doing things yourself are not necessarily the same skill set you need to go out and rate and buy a hundred unit deal. So I would just say, look, if you're, if you're making six figures and you got a hundred K or 200 K in the bank, I would say go out and do your first syndication, but you know, I don't want to be promotional, but like, it's just how I started. Like, you look, I mean, Jimmy, where did I meet you? I met you at a mastermind, Mm -hmm. right? Like go and surround yourself with other people that are doing it. Get a coach, get a mentor, be part of an investor community. And it doesn't have to be mine, but like, I wouldn't recommend somebody go out and buy a hundred unit complex with no experience by reading blogs and free resources. Like we are not lacking information right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, um, I'd love to hear, you know, maybe one of the best deals you ever came across or how you found it, how you purchased it, or maybe even a deal of one of your clients. Um, and then one, maybe one of the worst deals that you ever did as well. I think it's good to kind of balance the spectrum and let people know the the upside of this game of real estate investing, but also some of the dangers in it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about two good ones. One was the first deal I ever did. It was 32 units. I bought it for a million bucks. Um, actually it was 996,000, but roughly a million bucks. I didn't need to put a lot of renovation into it. The guy that bought it was a, um, renovator. Like he, he, he buys old ugly duckling properties and then he fixes them up and then he sells them. So he was like a flipper. Okay. And I didn't want to flip. I wanted to buy hold for a while and then sell after say five years. And so that's what I did. I bought a nice clean property that was fixed up that he didn't want to manage it. And, and so I bought it and I managed it and I optimized it through learning the ropes of, you know, how to add value to an existing asset, adding income, optimizing expenses, providing great maintenance and customer service, reducing turnover, all those things. And I sold it after three and a half years for about 1.5 million. So. You know, my down payment was 200 and I walked away with 700K in three and a half years. And it put about 4,000 a month in my pocket every month in cash flow. So like, that's a great deal. Like I would think everybody would say, hey, that's a great deal. Now, fast forward to 2020, um, you know, we're in the pandemic. Um, man, there was so much panic back then. I remember getting on the phone weekly on Zoom meetings with all my mentees because you know now we're in like april of 2020 and all we hear on the news is like eviction moratoriums nobody has to pay rent nobody has to go to work you know um and we were freaking out like people were thinking oh my god like what if nobody pays the rent but let me just tell you like at least in i i i it occurs to me that it happened in most markets because i was studying nationally what was happening but you know, 98 to 99% of, of, of residents across the board paid their rent because it wasn't just, it's not like you didn't have to pay. It was just, you didn't have to pay right now if you, if you could demonstrate a hardship, but that rent that you owed still accrued. And at some point you would have to pay it. Right. And, and then depending on where you were at, like if you were say in Texas, you know, they were a little bit more, um, supportive of landlords than say like in Seattle, you know, where they formed their own country for a period of time. You know, if you remember the independent Republic of Chaz, you yep, know, yep. you remember that. 
So, um, yeah, so, so I bought a deal on December 2020 and I got it through a friend. Like it was, I'll never forget. It was October of 2020 and I had a really big earned income that year and I was going to pay a lot of tax and I was freaking out because my earned income was like, I don't know, it was like four or five million dollars at, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm going to pay over a million in tax if I don't do something. So I'm calling my broker, all the brokers I know in Dallas, all my friends, and this is a now this is a business where it's like a big business, but it's not like yeah. people, know people, you know. And so one of my buddies owned the deal, and he just said, "Hey, if you could sell it for, if you buy this property, and I can't remember the price. I think it was like he's like, if you could pay eighty five thousand a unit for this deal, I'll I'll sell it to you. And of course, I underwrote it." And it was worth about 85,000 a unit. And he knows that because this guy owned like 20,000 units. Like he knows what his properties are worth. But of course, I tried to get a better deal. Like you never take the first offer, right? So I'm like, oh, I'll buy it right now for 80. And he goes, he crosses his arms. Like, I want to make sure. I don't know if this is on video, but he's like, Brad, you know, it's a good deal at 85 a door. And this is a buddy deal. If I, if I listed this deal, with the brokers and sell for like 88, 89, 90,000 a door that be multiple best and finals. Cause in like 2020, there was a lot of eyeballs and buyers going after multifamily, like a lot of competition. Right. And so I bought it for 85,000 a door. And I remember he told me, he goes, Brad, you don't have to do anything to the, and he was from West Texas. That's why I have the accent. He's like, you don't have to do anything. You just got to buy it, hold it and sell it in three years. And, and, you know, you'll buy, pay 13 million for it and walk away with 16 million. Well, it turned out better than that. I bought it for 13 million in December of 2020. I bought it mostly with my own money. I put 4 million of my own money into the deal and I was 80, 85% owner. And then I got a few investors just to make up the difference. So, so number one, Jimmy, I, I put 4 million into that property and that year in 2020, even though I closed December 15th, I closed with 15 days left. I was able to write off the entire purchase price and I got a $4 million, um, depreciation loss in 2020. Wow. So that one deal, think about it. If I didn't do that deal, I would have paid 37% on 4 million of income, which is $1.6 million. But I avoided that and I put 4 million into a building and I paid no federal tax that year. So that was number one. So I had an immediate ROI of 1.6 million on my $4 million down payment. So that was like a 35% ROI within 15 days. That was number one. Number two is the deal cash flow. The first two years I had the property it made about a half a million dollars each year in cash flow. Wow. And then and then the best part is when I sold it right before things crashed. I sold it in the first quarter of 2023 for 19 and a half million dollars and I paid 13 million. Wow. So at two years in two years I made a capital gain of six million dollars. So I had the tax savings the cash flow and the capital gains. And that was probably the best deal I ever did in terms of ROI. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's incredible, man. I, uh, I saw something in the news today. I'd love your opinion on, I just saw that Kamala Harris, you know, she's running for president that she wants to tax unrealized capital gains. And I just love your opinion of why that would be a disaster. Well, look, I, I, I think that I've learned a lot about taxes and, you know, my accountant wrote a lot of books. He's, and I don't mind mentioning his name. He, he, he wrote a lot of books and was associated with Robert Kiyosaki. So he's a guy named Tom Wheelwright. And he taught me a lot about taxes. And what he taught me is that the government uses taxes to incentivize our behavior. Meaning like, you know, if you have a child, you get a tax credit. Mm-hmm. If you invest in clean energy... You get a tax credit. Maybe if you buy an electric car, you get a tax credit. If you invest in solar, maybe you get a tax credit. It used to be if you invest in oil, 
you got a tax credit. <clears throat> mm. I don't know if it still is now because the current administration seems less favorable to our oil. So the deal is, look, if you invest in housing, you get tax incentives. Okay. So if they raise capital gains tax, what it does is it makes people less likely to do things where they incur big capital gains. Like it just does. So like, you know, if, if they, if they rate, if they eliminate, here would be another question. Like, and I just did a zoom meeting on this for my students. Like what would a Trump Vance administration look like versus a Harris Waltz administration? Well, there are some things that could be good either way or bad either way. Like, I'm not saying everything Trump's going to do is great. Everything Harris is going to do is bad. But like, if Trump wins, it's likely that the 2017 tax cuts will continue. And if Harris wins, they won't. They'll be eliminated. And, and that's another thing. It's like, that'll eliminate depreciation. And so whether it's eliminating depreciation or increasing capital gains taxes, like there were some deals, Jimmy, that I wouldn't have done if it wasn't for the, the the bonus depreciation. And so you'd say, okay, well, Brad, that only benefits you. You you would have just paid more tax, but no, like the buildings that I bought were improved. The tenants got a better house, not a house, but a housing unit. Like, because we went in there, because we got the appreciation, we went in there. And we took a, a C class building and made it into a, a C plus. You know, we improved the countertops, the cabinets, the flooring, the amenities, the pool furniture, the management, the customer service. We up leveled the maintenance staff, you know, the timeliness of the work orders. So like if they if they tax us more or eliminate incentives for us, they think that there's a benefit. But there's actually a cost, and the cost is not just to their business owners. The cost is to the people living in the buildings. Those working class families will have less people investing in their communities, and they'll have a, a lesser quality of life because of it. Yeah, very well said. I mean, you, does that, do you agree with that? Like, you could disagree with me if you want. Like, Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's I was more worried about the unrealized capital gains. That's what they're talking about now, where you're getting taxed before you even sell the property. And that's just a whole nother can oh. of worms they're trying to open. That's what she announced today was they want to tax 25 percent on unrealized capital gains. Well, that yeah, that's that is crazy. Um, <laughs> so let's, like so like here's an example. So let's say I buy this deal for $10 million. And so let's say at the end of two years, it's worth 14. And so they could tax me on a $4 million gain. Right. Well, first of all, how do we even know who, who's going to determine what's what is worth? Right. There's one issue is what, like, do I have to hire an appraiser as, a, as the owner or does the government hire an appraiser or do they use the tax assessed value? And so like determining fair market value on an annual basis is not, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of ways it could be determined and who pays for it. Okay. Yeah. And what a house will appraise for versus what you're going to walk away with, what a buyer is willing to pay is a very different right. thing. But then what happens what, here, here's, here's the situation. You know, I, I bought a deal in 2019 for 12 million. And in 2022, it was worth 17 million. Mm -hmm. But I didn't sell it in 2022 like I sold the other deal. I sold it last month, Jimmy. And you know what I sold it for? 13 million. I bought it for 12. It was worth 17. But because we're in a downturn now, like a winter season, it's only worth 13. <clears throat> so what if I would have got taxed on the 17 million? And now another year goes by and it's only worth 13. Now what happens? Do I get? I would guess I, you get a tax credits back, but I don't know. I don't know. How that what happens? Like, 
I had no I, doubt. I think, That's well, my I point. Is it's just it's it was just it would completely halt the economy. And I think if people, what I wanted to I wanted to bring that up because if people haven't really looked into this and studied this, you know, we have trillions and trillions of dollars of debt, and they're saying that by doing unrealized capital gains, they think they could gain another five hundred billion dollars in taxes for the government. But at the end of the day, that wouldn't move the needle at all. And what you're talking about is a complete halt in the way that people act in order to push the economy forward. And we'll never be able to tax our way into wealth. And so I just, it's just worth mentioning here yeah. with somebody else that understands real estate. Oh my God. Like, and I, I didn't pick up on that nuance when you said unrealized and, and, and now I'm like sitting there, like, I got to go read this. Like I, I, I was on zooms all day. I yeah, they're dead. They're dead serious about it. They're trying. I mean, it would have literally destroyed the entire economy. Dude, this is crazy. Like, and I'm not a stock investor, but let's say the same with stocks. Like, so what if I buy a stock at a hundred? And now at the end of the year, it's 150 and I get taxed on it. But then there's a there's a downturn, which there's always corrections in here and there. And now it goes down to 80. Like what happens? Well, it's the it's the best analogy I can give is I've had a lot of buddies that got divorced and they had to pay off, you know, the pay out the spouse or whatever. And you have to end up selling all of your assets just to pay the 50 percent that is owed to them. Otherwise, you've got your wife owning half your company and she's never stepped foot in the building. Uh, or vice versa, right? Or uh, you have these situations where you can't hold your real estate, so prices end up getting all screwed up because people are selling in a time when they don't have to. Anyway, I just think it's an important point for people that, um, you know, it's some things sound good on paper to people that haven't really looked into what would happen. But that was one that I just saw today, and I was just like, oh, man, I got to ask Brad about this when I have him on the on the podcast. But for somebody that wants to get started in real estate, Brad, somebody wants to start this real estate journey at, I think anyone listening to this podcast, probably a little overwhelmed. If you've never done any real estate before, you're like, geez Louise, they're talking some big numbers, some big houses. What's just your best piece of advice for just getting started? Let's say a kid's straight out of college. Maybe he's got 50 grand his parents gave him on his wedding or something. But um, what's the best way to get going in real estate? Well, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that in a couple of different ways. If you're just out of college, I think, you know, you know do well in your job. Like, save your money. And don't stop learning. You know, so many people, they stop learning when they get out of college or university. Like, keep learning. Like, learn something. Like, you know, learn digital marketing. Learn copywriting. Learn real estate. Learn mm -hmm. dropship. Like, there's so many businesses that you could do on the side. And real estate is one of those businesses that you could do on the side. Now, I would also say if you're 35, I'd have a different conversation. If you're 35 and you're making... 150, 200,000 a year and you're in that hamster wheel like I was, you know, now, now we're talking because you could come right in. And if you have a hundred thousand or more saved, you could come right in and being, being a newbie is not a disadvantage. In fact, if sometimes like if you've already learned a certain way, like I, you, then I got to untrain them on the way they were doing this to do that. So like, and that's exactly how I started. Like, like my ideal client is me, you know, 20 years ago. It's like somebody that had a level head. I would assume I'm kind of level headed and, you know, you don't have to be the smartest tack in the room, but like if you have a level head on your shoulders and a degree or a trade that you've learned and you make good money and you've saved some money, like you could do this. It's a lot. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's not get rich quick. But it's a lot harder to get an engineering degree or an accounting degree or a business degree and for four years. Think of the investment you make. Four years of your life, $300,000 of money. So you can get a job. And then you go and work from nine to six for somebody else to make their dreams come true. You know? And so isn't it time to make your dreams come true? So I would just say that if you're in a place where like, and you're in the, you know, midlife or early, you know, right before midlife time period and, and, and you've done what you thought was right and you still not where you want to be, like, I would say you could do this, but you got to invest. And I would say the best investment you make is in the real estate between your ears, you know, not a building or a mobile home park or a single family home, but first invest in your, in your self. You know, and that, yeah, I'd say it the same way. I say, if you're not making at least $200,000 a year, your only investment should be in you making more money, like yeah. learning better skills and knowledge, because you just don't make enough money to really get wealthy until you're making a couple hundred grand a year in today's world. I mean, if we're being honest, um, yeah, like, um, yeah, like, so I get a lot of 
you know, people that come like they're 24, they got out of college. And I'm like, look, man, I'll give you like a ticket to my event and you can start planting the seeds for what you might want to do in the future. But like you want to earn income and be a, a great employee and save your money and maybe get a side hustle going and make more money. Yeah. Well, for people that want to look more into it, I know you got an event coming up. Give us a little bit of details on that and what they could expect to learn at a thing like that, Brad, and uh, and how they can contact you or reach out if they want to learn more about multifamily investing in real estate. Yeah. Th- thanks, Jimmy. This is a three-day event that I do every year, and it's in September. Uh, the, the dates are September 27, 28, and 29, and it's in Dallas, Texas. And I do it in Dallas for two reasons. My company is headquartered there and it's easy to get to from anywhere in the country. So whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast, it's it's a three-hour flight maximum. And during the three-day event, I teach my proven system. Like one of the things you asked that somehow we didn't get into, but it's like, what are the steps that it takes for somebody to penetrate and get into successfully the apartment business? And, and it's for people that want to syndicate, but also for people that maybe want to do their own deals. Mm or even want to learn enough to be like a passive investor. Like how do you evaluate deals and how do you vet teams and how do you select markets, you know, and how do you underwrite deals and like what's happening today? And, you know, and, and the, what, what worked, what worked two years ago when interest rates were 3% and, and there were 30 buyers going after the same deal. That's not where we're at today. So like Mm -hmm. what's these work today. And some of my events, Jimmy are not multi-speaker events, but this one is, and so not only will people learn from me, but they're going to learn from like eight incredible speakers. Uh, most of them are industry experts in real estate, but not all of them. Some of them are not even in real estate. And and so, you know, just the, the tickets are like a couple hundred bucks. And I would just say, look, even if even if you're just curious about real estate, but look, if you want to build wealth, if you want to uh if you're an entrepreneur, if you're curious about real estate, if you want to build wealth and pay less taxes, those are some of the core things that everybody's going to walk away with. Plus the networking and meeting other, you know, entrepreneurs and like-minded investors. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, guys, give Brad a look. If you're looking into multi-investment properties, the guy on 7,700 doors, he's literally helped his students sell over $6 billion worth of real estate. So Brad, so much appreciation for you coming on the podcast today and uh, sharing some of your wealth of knowledge, man. It's good to good to see you. And nice to run into you somewhere besides a Tony Robbins event for once, you know? I know. Yeah. I, I'm, I was so happy that we were able to make this happen. And, and hopefully your listeners will find it very valuable and useful. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Brad. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. Awesome.